Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Lok. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Hong Kong Baptist University. I'm also a fellow of the International Society for Science and Religion. And this book is in my area of specialization in science and religion. It discusses the relationship between how scientists and religious believers have thought about the origin of the universe. Well, ever since young, I've been very interested in the question of ultimate origins. I would like to ask my father, you know, where did I come from? Wanting to get to the bottom of things. As I grow older, I also begin to realize that you know, this question is very closely related to the issue concerning the meaning of life. So are we here just by a random accident? Do we exist because of a higher purpose? Is there a creator of the universe in whom we can find the answers to the meaning of life? So these are questions which I've been deeply interested about. Most scientists nowadays accept the Big Bang Theory, which says that our universe began with explosive expansion 13.8 billion years ago. Many scientists regard this as you know, the ultimate origin of our universe. However, nowadays, there are many other scientists who think that you know, there could be something else uh, before the Big Bang. So perhaps our universe came from another universe before that. Now, in my book, I argue that you know, there cannot be an infinite regress of causes and effects, and that there must be a first cause The theological argument is an argument that tries to show that our universe has a designer. You know, the order, the laws of nature, and the fine-tuning of the universe, which allow life to be possible in this universe. You know, that all these conditions are not the result of random chance, but is the result of a design right, by an intelligent designer. Whereas the Kalam cosmological argument is an argument that tries to show that there is a first cause of the universe, a first cause which brought the universe into being. And this first cause is a personal creator of the universe. Let's talk about the cosmological argument first. So the cosmological argument tries to show that there is a first cause. And we can begin to think about this by asking the question, so where did we come from? Now if we say I came from my parents, where did my parents come from? So if you say my parents came from my grandparents, now where did my grandparents come from? Now the cosmological argument tries to show there cannot be an infinite regress, and therefore there must be a first cause. Now why is it that there cannot be an infinite regress? I offered a number of arguments in my book. One of them is an argument that tries to show an infinite regress will be a vicious dependence regress. To illustrate this point, let us think about a series of train cars, and these train cars were not moving originally. So before the last train car began to move, the one before it has to begin to move first, because everyone is dependent on the one before it in order that it can begin to move. So everyone has to face the problem of depending on a prior dependent member. So what is required is a first puller, a train engine, which has the independent capacity to begin movement, and which doesn't depend on another thing before it to put it along. So likewise, before I begin to exist, my parents have to begin to exist first. So my beginning of existence depend on them, and theirs depend on their parents. Now if that is all there is, then obviously none of us will ever begin to exist, because everyone will be dependent on the one before it. So what is required is there must be a first cause, which has the capacity to exist independently which doesn't need to depend on something before it. So such a first cause must exist in order that other things will begin to exist. And then the next question that people will ask is, what is this first cause? Why I think that this first cause is a creator God? I answered this question in my book by providing a series of steps of arguments to demonstrate this conclusion. Now, firstly, this first cause must be something uncaused. And secondly, this first cause must also be something that is without a beginning. Because whatever begins to exist will require a cause. I demonstrate this point using what is known as a modus tollens argument. A modus tollens argument is a deductively valid argument if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. This is a kind of argument which is widely used in science. And I developed one such argument in my book 
to show that whatever begins to exist has a cause. If something began uncaused, then we would expect to see many other things begin to exist uncaused around us. However, that is not the case. For example, we do not see a tiger or elephant or dinosaur suddenly begin to exist uncaused around us. And therefore, we can know that it is not the case that something began uncaused. So this conclusion follows logically from the premises. So in my book, I explain in detail why is it the case that if something began uncaused, we will expect other things to begin to exist uncaused. And some of the reasons are because if something began uncaused, then there will be no cause that makes it the case that this thing, rather than other things, began to exist. And moreover, whatever difference that differentiates this thing from other things will only begin to exist when these things have already begun to exist. And moreover, the circumstances around us are compatible with other things beginning to exist. Therefore, we can know that it is not the case that something began to exist uncaused. And so this means that the first cause must be something that is without a beginning. Now, something that doesn't have a beginning will not require a cause. Because if something has no beginning, then that means that that thing has always existed. This first cause must also be something that is initially changeless. Because change is something that has a beginning. Whereas the first cause is something that has no beginning. How did something that is initially changeless cause the first change? How did it begin to change and to bring about the first event? Now, in order to bring about the first event from an initially changeless and beginningless state, I explain in my book that the first cause must have, firstly, the ability to bring about the first change or the first event in a way that is not determined by prior events. And secondly, the first cause must also have the capacity to prevent itself from changing. These two capacities describe what philosophers called libertarian freedom, which means that the first cause must be something free. You know, it must be able to control itself and also be able to freely bring about the first event. And so this kind of freedom is characteristic of a person with free will. And so this demonstrates that the, the first cause is a personal creator who can freely bring about the first events that result in the creation of the universe. And finally, this first cause must also have tremendous power in order to bring about the entire universe with its billions of stars and galaxies. And therefore, we have arrived at the conclusion that there must be a personal creator of the universe. So if you ask, why did the universe exist? The answer is, this universe must have ultimately came from a first cause that is without beginning, that is uncaused, that is initially changeless, that has libertarian freedom, and which also has tremendous power. And so such a first cause is what it means to say that there is a creator of the universe. Whatever science discover, we can ask what that comes from. So for example, if scientists discover a law of nature, we can ask you know, where did that law come from? Ultimately, as I argue in my book, you know, there cannot be an infinite regress of causes and effects. And so the law must ultimately come from a personal creator and a designer of the universe. And moreover, science itself requires deductive reasoning. We can use a deductive reasoning to show that the universe ultimately comes from an uncaused designer of the universe. As for empiricism, now this is a philosophical view which claims that all knowledge is based on experience that is derived from the senses. Now obviously we cannot go back in time to observe the beginning of the universe. But does it mean that we cannot know how the universe began? Well, I don't think so. Why? Because we don't need to directly observe something in order to find out the truth. We can have a sound argument. Now, a sound argument is an argument which is deductively valid and the premises are true. So if an argument is deductively valid and if the premises are true, the conclusion will be true. And I explain in my book that the Kalam cosmological argument as well as the teleological arguments, these two arguments are deductively valid and the premises are true. And therefore, we can know for sure that the conclusion must be true, that there must exist a creator and designer of the universe. The answer to this question depends on how you define God. In many religions, such as Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the word God is used to refer to the creator and designer of the universe. And since the Kalam and theological arguments show that there is a creator, right, that creator, by definition, will be the God. 
I've been interested in the question of ultimate origins since I was young. Later, when I grew up, I had the opportunity to study science, medicine, philosophy, and religious studies. And after I did my PhD, I also had the opportunity to debate this question with some of the world leading atheist philosophers in the world. And so as a result of my debate, I began to realize that I can formulate these arguments in a more rigorous way. I wrote down my thoughts and developed my arguments and that is how the book came to be. Most of the reviews I have received so far are positive. So, and, and also other uh, reviewers of the book have given very positive feedback as well. Now, if there are any substantial uh, objections or criticism to my book, I will respond to them on my webpage on academia.edu. I have written a number of books in Chinese as well. So for those of you who understand Chinese better, you can check out my book called uh, Sing Kong Peihou De Chen Li. Right, so this book will explain uh, the topics in a more uh, easier to understand way. And I will also encourage you all to read books by other experts, uh, such as William Lane Craig and Luke Barnes, to find out more about the arguments which I develop in my book. Currently, I'm writing a few academic papers and also a book on the subject of natural theology. So this project will bring together my various previous publications on the various arguments related to God's existence and also address the problem of evil and suffering. So it will provide further arguments and evidence to show that the universe is created by a loving creator who allowed suffering for a good purpose and that in him, we can find the ultimate meaning of life.